He kept up the fire with dry grass and a good supply of firewood, tending it day and night because it seemed such a wonderful thing. He liked it best at night when it took the place of the sun, giving warmth and light. It meant so much to him he fell in love with it and was convinced that of all the things he had, this was the best. Seeing how it always moved upwards, as though trying to rise, he supposed it must be one of those jewel substances he saw shining in the sky. Hello and welcome once again to The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And this time we're going to be reading a particularly interesting and less known work than some of the works we've been looking at. It's Ibn Tufail's Hai Ibn Yakzan. Oh, that's not how you say it, is it? Well, uh, it's it's a, a transliteration from Arabic. So it's a, a character that is often transliterated either DH or Z. So Hai Ibn Yakzan. Okay. Which is not any better, really, than you were doing. But um, but that's a neat point, right? Some of our listeners may already be familiar with this very odd and interesting 12th century philosophical tale, but others will not have heard of it before. And it's, a re- I think, a really neat and counterintuitive choice for our cluster on philosophical literature. It's a book that I first read a few years ago, and I just I just love it to death. It's so weird, isn't it? It's a weird and fascinating text, and it's not like many other texts that I know, certainly not like many other 12th century texts that I know. Mm. And I'm very excited about sharing it with people who, who may not know it. But I'm also, yes, frustrated that my my Duolingo couple weeks of studying Arabic was not enough to give me a a a, a, a a good pronunciation of some of the some of the consonants that we don't have in English. And I mean it's also interesting that this is not so familiar a text in English literary or maybe even philosophical circles that we've sort of naturalized it and we have a standard way of pronouncing it now. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting point. You know, of the works that we've talked about, a lot of them are composed in English. Of the ones that are in translation, most of the time, these have been works that are kind of canonical or standardized so that we don't think twice about, you know, giving a sort of normalized Western pronunciation of the title. Like we don't worry about when we do Homer's Odyssey, we don't worry about pronouncing Odyssey in the authentic Greek way, right? Or Homer, for that matter. Or saying Homeros, you know, <laughs> these things, right? So it's kind of neat to expose that gap when there's a work that's normalized into what we expect to see in literature and what are works that we're, we're, we are coming across now. They're in the act of coming across into our, our corpuses of literature. Well, that reminds me, we should, we should pause for a moment. You mentioned Homer's Odyssey. Yeah. We, should, we should give a shout out to friend of the show and recent guest, Emily Wilson, the translator of the version of the Odyssey that we looked at and who joined us for a bonus episode talking about that translation. And she was just awarded a MacArthur Award, which is amazing. Yeah. I mean, a, a so-called genius award, right? A no strings award for people who are just doing really neat creative work um, that has an impact. And uh, her work on translation absolutely does that. Yeah, it's 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 the award we all want to get. <laughs> I don't think you're supposed to admit that, but yes, absolutely. Uh, so congratulations to Emily, and yeah, that's fantastic news. Yeah, we should point out that we are working with the translation of Hayab and Yakdan that was done by Len Evan Goodman and published by University of Chicago Press. There are a few other translations floating about out there, but this one's fairly recent and it seemed pretty good. Yeah, it's actually from the early 70s, but it's been updated a few different times. Um, the notes are kind of idiosyncratic. I don't know if you noticed that when you were looking at the text. I did. They're really enjoyably idiosyncratic, I think. Yeah, like, you know, he'll be talking about, I don't know, Neoplatonic emanation and he's like, oh, you should read, you know, Andrew Marvell's 17th century poem on a drop of dew. And I'm like... <laughs> Sure, but you know, <laughs> odd choice, but sure. Um, so it's idiosyncratic, but it's a very readable translation. Yes. And also, we should say that there is a, a bit of a content warning here. We are going to be, it's not quite violence towards animals, but it's close enough that if that sort of thing really bothers you, uh, there will be some discussion around things related to that. So if that's not for you or not for you right now, we just wanted to let you know. So when we did Middlemarch in our last episode, we were looking at a novel, but it had some philosophical underpinnings, and we took some time to dig at them and, and, and sort of unearth them and talk about them. And I think this time we're going to be doing kind of the opposite. This is an explicitly philosophical text. It's a, it's a thought experiment in philosophy trying to prove some philosophical points. And we're going to be looking at it mostly for its literary characteristics. I'm not particularly qualified to talk about the philosophy that's going on here. 
Maybe you feel a little more comfortable about that than I do, but. Well, yes and no, right? Like, I mean, I'm not a philosopher. I'm a literature person, right? But I know a little bit about the historical philosophy that informs Ibn Tufal's work, especially with regard to Neoplatonism, which is a certain set of commitments that shows up in really important ways in Islamic philosophy, but also has a very dynamic life in Greek and Latin philosophy, right? So that is something that um, I think we might end up talking about a little bit. But, you know, you were saying it's a philosophical text that we're going to examine the literary qualities of. And that's true, but it's it's also like a weird hybrid kind of thing. Like the genre of it within the context of Arabic literature studies is a, a kisa. It's a short story or a tale or like a little little narrative, right? Not necessarily like the Latin exemplum, but like it's a it's a it's a story that has deeper meaning, right? That can be expounded in sort of allegorical or figurative terms. And in some ways that means it's a philosophical text that's got like a story within it. But it's also, I don't know, the story is woven into it so intricately that I don't feel totally comfortable saying it's a work of philosophy or it's a work of literature. And there's a few other works that are like that, like Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy. It's a book that shows up in philosophy survey courses, uh, you know, historical philosophy survey courses, but it also shows up in literature courses. Or the Symposium, right, which we talked about before by Plato, right? Like, if you look at it from one side, it's literature. If you look at it from the other side, it's philosophy. And I feel like Im Tufal's Hai Im Yaktan is a little bit like that. You look at it from one side, it's philosophy. You look at it from the other side, it's literature. Yeah, and I think it's definitely using a lot of its literary characteristics in order to help both rhetorically impress upon you its philosophical points, but also to create an interesting context for them and, and, and to show them playing out. And also, like, it's kind of inviting you, reader, to read in this penetrating, exegetical, allegorical, figurative kind of way, right? Like, in other words, we learn so much about that way of interpreting, as it's carried out by High. You know, we as readers are also being invited to interpret in that kind of way. And so the the function of the tale there is for us to work upon and sort of untease that and use it as a gateway into other kinds of knowledge, right? That's true, because this isn't just a philosophical text as we would think about it today. It's, it's also bringing in elements of mysticism. Absolutely. And the importance and validity of mystical understandings of the world and approaches to the world and the limits that our ability to talk about the world, so to speak, rationally, philosophically, etc. You know, understanding that those have limits, arguing very strongly that you can't understand everything through that approach. Well, yeah. Like, so in terms of like philosophical commitments with Hay, we move through a, a knowledge of the physical world, natural philosophy to higher levels, right? To metaphysics, right? Um, and then beyond that into what we can only talk about as theological realms, right? Theological commitments. And not theology understood so much in the sense of a set of laws or cultural practices, but rather theology understood as a mode of enlightenment where you come to a full knowledge, where the self kind of gets annihilated, right? Um, and in that sense, this is a really different kind of philosophical piece of literature as opposed to Middlemarch, right? Because in Middlemarch, when we're talking about philosophy there, we're talking about ethics. We were talking about the ways of living in the world as an ethical human being and making yourself a meaningful part of that social fabric that knits together all human beings. This is really different from that. The philosophical commitments are like edging on to um, the realm of theology, right? So it's a very it's a very different philosophical environment. Yeah, this is not interested in ethics. It's kind of the opposite. Oh no, yeah. Well that's that's for the that's for the people who are, you know, not quite up to enlightenment, you know. Who are in the world still, yeah. Yeah. It's, it, the, that, that, but that's the, you put your finger on it, right? Like it's a question of, are we interested in this world or are we interested in reaching beyond this world? I mean, for George Eliot, she's really interested in this world. Who are, who are we to one another in this world? And this is quite different. Well, let me give a quick summary of the book. And then, you know, for people who don't know it, they can finally know what we're talking about, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, so, it's a very short book, I suppose. It takes about an hour to read. And also don't get bogged down. If you go to read it, don't get bogged down in the opening pages, which are sort of all about rehearsing a whole range of philosophical arguments. Feel free to skip ahead till you get to the, sort of the, the plot line, and then you can always back up and read that part again. Yeah, there's a whole introductory section, which just puts everything into context. That's not super interesting for those of us who are reading it for its literary qualities. Or first-time readers. Yeah, or for first-time readers, although I'm sure it's super interesting for, uh, for for specialists and philosophers. So we begin, well, actually, we begin with a bit of a mystery because there's some argument as to where High comes from. So either he's born in, you know, like the normal way from parents who are people and people who don't want 
their child to be found out about because it's complicated, but they put him into a crate and send him off to sea in that crate where it goes off to this equatorial island, which is uh, ideal for human thriving, or he's born on that island itself in this other version of the story. And the conditions are just right for humans to be birthed from the clay. Spontaneous generation. Yeah, there's a fascinating passage about that. Either way, he's discovered by a doe in this translation. Sometimes it's an antelope or sometimes it's a gazelle, but, you know, a doe, who nurses him and adopts him as one of her own. And as High grows up, he realizes that he's different from all the other creatures on the island. He's the only human there. So he has to figure out how to protect himself from the other animals. And especially once his mother, his doe mother dies, has to figure out how to feed himself. And this sets the rational part of his mind to work. And much of the story consists of High observing the world and figuring out aspects of how it works. And he figures out how to feed and clothe himself. He figures out the four elements. He distinguishes between animal, vegetable, and mineral. He discerns a driving force behind materiality, like a soul, and then discerns that the world must have been created by some creating force, and figures out some things about what that force must be like, and how his goal should be to emulate and become one with that godlike force. He really reinvents philosophy from observation and rationalization. And eventually, he has an ecstatic moment in which he can see beyond the physical world. And he tries then to be in that ecstatic state as often as he can. And eventually, a man named Absal from a neighboring island visits and teaches High language, and the two of them discover that High's conclusions match up really well with Absal's religion. So Absal takes High to his home island, where High attempts to encourage the locals to follow his path, in other words, to be more like God. Enlightenment. Enlightenment. But these islanders are much too tied to the material world. And High and Absal quickly realize that there's little they can do to help them. So they give up, and they return to High's Island, and they spend the rest of their days pursuing their ecstatic connection with what we would probably call God. The end. That's the whole plot. And it's so cool, right? Because there's, you know, as you were saying, there's sort of two beginnings, two alternative kind of Genesis stories for High. And we can talk about that. That's incredibly interesting. But then there's also, in a sense, almost two ends, right? You know, you get the sense of, you know, when he has, High has that devotional practice and he achieves these ecstatic visionary experiences and he's able to really, you know, maximize that. I mean, there's there's, there's a sense of climax in that, right? Like the... Uh, of, of what he's achieved there spiritually, right? Um, and then there's this whole other thing that happens, right? You know, the whole story with Absal and the visit to the neighboring island. Like, there's this one trajectory of the narrative that ends in the spiritual heights, and then there's this other trajectory of the narrative that explores this world and finds it wanting. Yeah. That's kind of neat. It is super neat. As we've mentioned, there's not really a lot of plot or conflict except for sort of an internal conflict as he's trying to figure things out. Mm. And so for the reader, a lot of what might make this text interesting is that process of seeing High observe and think about things and come to conclusions about them. It's a it's a process that we saw when we read Frankenstein, mm-hmm. where the monster was observing the people in the cottage, going about their days and and figuring out how this family operated, figuring out language from them, figuring out all this all this stuff about the world as a smart observer. And I think at, at that time we both said that we were really struck by that passage, that that's mm-hmm. a really a trope for us. Well, this whole question of like, I mean, there's a whole range of literary texts that are really interested in this question of like, what is it that makes a human being a human being what you know like where are the boundary lines and in frankenstein that played out in in a particular set of ways and that was incredibly interesting to talk about but for high it plays out slightly differently like where he's disambiguating himself from the animals so there's this one passage where he's in that process of understanding what he is relative to the living things he sees around him the plants and the other animals and and, uh says this High discovered in himself an aversion toward some things and an attraction to others, even after the things themselves were no longer objects of his immediate experience, for their images were fixed in his mind. He observed the animals from this perspective and saw how they were clothed in fur, hair, or feathers, how swiftly they could run, how fiercely they could fight, and what apt weapons they had for defense against any attacker, horns, tusks, hooves, spurs, and claws. Then he looked back at himself and realized how naked and defenseless he was. And and that that looking, you know, looking at the animals and thinking about the animals, right? It's not just immediate experience. Like, how could I put, he doesn't know about animals only when he's in the moment of looking at an animal. He can also think about it, reflect upon them, right? They're in his imagination and in his memory now, right? So he observes the animals from this perspective. He thinks about what they're like. And then 
he looked back at himself and realized how naked he was. Right. And so that's kind of neat, right? Like this whole sense of like, you figure out who you are relative to the things you are not. And especially because, you know, one of the things he recognizes about himself is that he has no counterpart, right? Like the animals have counterparts, right? But he can't find anyone who looks like himself. And Intifal doesn't go too far with that. But, you know, we're invited to think about like, there is no mate, there is no counterpart, right? And um, thinking about gender in here is, is super interesting. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, before we unpack all of that, do you want to do you want to give us a little bit more information about Ibn Tufail and the context that this text emerged from? Absolutely. We don't know a whole lot about Ibn Tufail. His full name, I'm not going to give his full, full name, which is super long, but Abu Bakr Ibn Tufail al-Andalusi. I mean, there are a lot of other names, but those are the crucial ones. Abu Bakr is his name, Ibn Tufail is his patronym, the father he's descended from. And al-Andalusi, indicating he comes from Spain, uh, Muslim Spain. Born there, living there at a time when Muslims, Jews, and Christians lived together in sometimes harmonious and sometimes violent ways. Um, his dates we know pretty accurately. He dies in 1185 or 1186, born probably around 1105. And the reason these dates are kind of interesting is a lot is going on politically during this time. Um, Muslim rule in the Iberian Peninsula had been going on for quite a while, but there had been a big change um, that took place during Ibn Tufail's own lifetime when the Almohads, who sort of came up from North Africa, a Berber kind of dynasty, moved into the Iberian Peninsula and consolidated their power there. So they really come into a position of strength in the 1170s, and they stay strong past Ibn Tufail's death until the early part of the 13th century. And the reason this is interesting is because it's a time of political, military flux, right, that Ibn Tufail is living through. And it's a religiously conservative, sometimes quite repressive kind of dynasty, right? Um, that said, Ibn Tufail inhabits a number of um, sort of important government appointments during his lifetime. He's a minister to the governor of Granada, and he serves the dynasty in a couple of different ways, even rising up to be chief physician to the ruling sultan. So he's somebody who's, how can I put it, living in a time of a complicated political time, a time of military turmoil, um, but he's able to navigate it pretty successfully and, and has a position at court. And it sounds like he's very interested in other types of science as well. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, we have this philosophical work of his, you know, um, Hayim Yaktan, but we know that he wrote works that were on medicine and astronomy, though we don't, this is the only complete work of his that survives, but we have um, attestations to his work and descriptions of his work. So he's somebody who's really in the natural philosophy, like science realm, more than anything else. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because when we're reading this text, the, the discussion of embryology and other aspects of the material world, I mean, those, to my mind, are some of the richest and most exciting parts of the whole thing. Yeah, no, it shows through. He, he is excited to have high learn about all these things and to have sort of cutting edge science. Yeah. And this commitment to science and philosophy, you know, which we would separate out as two different fields, but, you know, have a very richly entangled history, right? This aspect of Ibn Tufal puts him very much in the lineage of Avicenna or Ibn Sina, who's a really, really super important philosopher, right? He's writing in the 10th and 11th century and who's known primarily for his canon of medicine, his major sort of medical treaties, but also wrote incredibly rich philosophical texts of various sorts. So Ibn Tufail, insofar as a philosopher, kind of fits into that heritage, that lineage. And in fact, this narrative, the story of Hai Ibn Yaktan, he's developing this out of some texts that he's received from Avicenna, either orally transmitted or else he may have known the written versions. Again, very short narratives, little tales that um, Avicenna had written that had a kind of philosophical higher level that could be folded out of the literary text, right? So he had written a little narrative about Hai Ibn Yaktan, Avicenna had earlier on, but it was really just describing his, him as a kind of a learned sage. And what Ibn Tufal does is he gives us the whole origin story. He tells us the whole backstory, where he came from, how he came to be, how he learned, how he mastered the material world. Um, so that's a kind of interesting part of the sort of philosophical genealogy of Ibn Tufal's work. Hmm. And then there's a rich afterlife to it as well. Yeah, so the one thing I know about its afterlife is that eventually it gets translated into English, and then it may have been one of the sources for Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Well, let's begin at the very beginning, perhaps, and talk about the weird parentage situation that we're given here. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, it is. He's got both the two competing stories about where he physically comes from, and then 
both of them are sort of passed aside for this other, more important parental figure of the doe or gazelle or whatever you want to translate that as. Yeah, what do you make of these like two origin stories? Like he says, there's two different versions of it that people know about, and you know they're both out there. He doesn't require that you should choose between the two different stories, but um, there's the one where the sister of the king like wants to control who she marries, and so she instead lawfully decides to. Uh, marry her cousin and uh, they have this baby and then it has to be covered up right so she puts the child in a a case or a coffer it's a word that can also mean um, a coffin right so it's it's a a strangely ambiguous kind of term anyway she sends the child adrift and uh, he washes up on the island or there's this other story about spontaneous generation and i just find that so weird that he's like you know here are two options and um you know what do you make of that those two different backstories so i think it's doing a few Interesting things. Uh, first off, it seems that, if I had to guess, I think Ibn Tufal is much more interested in the emerging from the clay story. Yeah. It's, got, it's much longer. It's got a lot more detail to it. And it's a space for him to imagine these theories of how that yeah. might work. It's very science fiction-y, that part, isn't it? It is. It, it, it's very frankenstein in a sense as well, in that you're creating life out of an unexpected and non-traditional way. And my understanding is that this idea actually emerged from Aristotle, who hypothesized that this might be technically possible, even if we didn't have any firsthand observation of it. I think it's in Generation and Corruption. I haven't read that for a long time, but I think in there he says that that is hypothetically possible. And this text is very interested in what would be hypothetically possible. Yeah. Well, and I think that's part of the reason why he's going to give you these two origin stories. Like, here's the conventional one where there's a mom and a dad, like, and this. And then he's saying, but some also claim that high came into being spontaneously, right? And, you know, I'm going to tell you how that might have worked. And I'm just going to read a little bit of it because it's so cool. Those who say that he came into being spontaneously say that in a pocket of earth on that island, over the years, a massive clay worked until hot and cold, damp and dry, were blended in just the proper way, their strengths perfectly balanced. This fermented mass of clay was quite large, and parts of it were in better equilibrium than others, more suited than the rest for becoming human gametes. The midmost part was the best proportion and bore the most perfect equivalence to the makeup of man. The clay labored and churned, and in the viscous mass there formed what looked like bubbles in boiling water. In the very middle formed a tiny bubble divided in half by a delicate membrane and filled by a fine gaseous body, optimally proportioned for what it was to be. And then he goes on to sort of, um, as you say, it's a really long passage that tells us both about the, I don't know, physical properties of embryology, the the formation of the heart, the formation of the liver, and the formation of the brain, and how these three organs then give rise to three systems that interact. But he also talks about how this becomes imbued with life. And again, it's very science fiction-y, very Frankenstein-y. Um, it's the same way that when light flows out and is reflected in mirrors, that's the same way that the creative force brings things into being in the world. It's a really amazing passage. It is. It's 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 really great. And I think the reason he includes the other story, the conventional story, is is as a kind of sop for the people who think this is too much. Mm. Some people are going to hear that story and think, oh, that that would never happen. Well, here's a more conventional fairy tale, so to speak, style story about how this might come to pass. Don't get hung up on it. It's not the important part. And and he'll do that strategy a few times over the course of the book. That's a really neat point. And now you're making me think, I hadn't thought of this before, that, you know, we get to the end of the narrative and we're aware that there are people who, for whom the path of enlightenment makes sense and is accessible. And then there are others who should just basically follow the rules and, you know, stick to the literal level because that's all they're capable of. In a way, those two origin stories are already setting us up for these two different modes, right? The more adventurous mode and the less adventurous one. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So, so, so whichever way you you fall on that spectrum. Nevertheless, you're going to have young High be discovered by this gazelle. This this gazelle who has lost her own fawn. And so she has milk. And so she has milk and a desire to mother, I suppose, and, and takes him on as her own. And it's a very, like, it's not a, a very indulgent, so to speak, description of their relationship, but it nevertheless comes off as a very sweet one. Oh, it is adorable. Like she, you know, she takes him, once he can walk, he's two years old and he can walk. She, um, you know, conveys him or leads him to places where he can find water and shows him where the most ripe fruits are. And then if he still wants milk, um, she obliges him. It's so sweet. Um, The hard-shelled fruits she cracked between her teeth, or if he wanted to go back for a while to milk, she let him. 
It's so sweet, you know. And at nightfall, she would bring him back to the spot where she had found him, nestling him to herself among the feathers with which the little ark had been cushioned. So it's it's a. I think we're meant to see this as a very, I don't know, like paradise-like environment in some ways. You know, the gazelle is. I think the choice of the gazelle is. Um, it probably has to do with the fact that it's said to be one of the animals in paradise, right? right. So it's, a, it's an almost an Edenic kind of environment here. Yeah, no, absolutely. And even as he grows up and he's sort of deciding to clothe himself, he clothes himself with the body of a dead eagle that he discovers. Yeah, that's such a cool passage. And boldly taking hold of the eagle, I cut off the wings and tail just as they were all in one piece. And he prepares it and so forth. And then uh, thus he got a fine covering that not only kept him warm, but also so terrified the animals <laughs> that not one of them would fight with him or get in his way. In fact, none would come near him except the doe that had nursed and raised him. Yeah. You know, so she's not even put off by this message that uh, Hai is sending out to the world. Well, it tells us that they have a relation, that they, they, they've grown into a relation. And yet this relation then changes. Immediately afterwards, we are in the, in the text, we are in the point where he's now seven and she's getting older. Those gazelles don't live that long. One thing that's so touching, I think, is, you know, um, just before she, she dies, there's this lovely reversal of how he, she had nurtured him. He tries to nurture her, right? When she grew old and weak, he would lead her to rich pastures and gather sweet fruits to feed her. It's exactly the same transaction, you know, that we'd seen just a little bit earlier, but he can't save her. And this leads to one of the most fascinating passages in the text, I think. Oh, yeah. So she, she dies. All her movements and bodily functions came to a standstill. And when the boy saw her in such a state, he was beside himself with grief. And he tries to, you know, wake her up. He peered into her eyes and ears, but no damage was apparent. And he starts exploring her, trying to figure out what is wrong. What's, what's happening? Where is she hurting? Yeah, what can he fix? He hoped to discover the place where she was hurt so he could take away the hurt and allow her to recover. But he could not even make a start. He was powerless. Hmm. So he then does what any young child would do. And seeing nothing wrong with her from the outside, he decides to start exploring her inside. He says, there remains some hope of her recovery if he could find the critical organ and take away the hurt. So he decided to cut open her breast and find out what was inside. Uh, he had observed in the past that the parts of animals' dead bodies were solid, having no hollows except for those of the head, chest, and abdomen. So he felt certain that the vital organ he was looking for must occupy one of these three cavities. So he's going to go and look at these cavities. He's going to try to find them and see if there's any blockage or obstruction that's preventing her from thriving, from living. And like this goes on for pages and pages. It's, it's, it's this detailed <laughs> thing. So, so what did you make of this scene? Oh my God, it's so gross, you know, and it's like... I mean, he basically dissects her. And and it's one of the things that's so fascinating about the passage is it emerges from grief, right? I mean, it absolutely emerges from grief. He, he's, he's been trying to care for her. Um, she dies. He's trying to understand what's happened. You know, he reasons to try to understand what could be wrong. What can he do? How can he fix it? But at some point, that that effort to cure, that effort to heal that's motivated by grief kind of shades over into this weird kind of anatomy lesson. I mean, he still has the desire to try to heal her up to a certain point, but by the time he gets to the end of it, he realizes there's nothing he can do there. Um, once he's finished, you know, sort of taking her apart, uh, it says this, realizing that whatever had lived in that chamber, the chamber of the heart, um, had left while its house was intact before it had been ruined, I saw that it was hardly likely to return after all the cutting and destruction. The body now seemed something low and worthless compared to the being he was convinced had lived in it for a time and then departed. Oh, yeah, that passage. Yeah, so this cutting and destruction, I mean, it's what he's done. But it's led him to, for the first time, a knowledge of the spirit, like of spirituality, understood as the thing that animates flesh to be alive. And this is the first step on an incredibly important part of his journey, right? Yes, but before we before we follow him on that journey, I still want to linger here a bit because I find that fascinating. You're right that it, especially in the way that it's told, it's told in this very clinical way. Oh yeah. So you don't get a sense of what emotions are going through his mind. There's not that sense no. of interiority. It's just like I'm going to figure this problem out and I'm going to explore. And then oh dear, this this won't be fixed. She's she's cut to pieces now. The the thing that I loved is not there. But this is all it's all driven by love. And an intimacy. Yes. And it becomes yes. this very strange way of, of grieving, I guess. But it's as if this is the most natural thing to do in the world. 
Well, it's the path to knowledge, right? And the path to knowledge is sometimes like beautiful and sweet, right? But the path to knowledge is sometimes also dreadful, right? And I think that's what's going on there. It's a dreadful path to knowledge. I mean, which is great in a sense and that it will be transcendent, but it's also horrifying. And it's what that engagement in materiality, right? That's the horrifying thing. I think it's also fascinating that because the mother figure is an animal, Mm. he can get away with this. It's hard to imagine what this passage would have been like (laughs) with the human mother, even though it would have been the same thing as a reader. It would have just, it would have been too much. He would not have been able to write it that way, I don't think. I mean, you could not. No, I don't think you could get away with that. Which is a a fascinating thing about the role that, especially in these early sections, that animals play. Mm -hmm. They become a thing that is licit to do that kind of investigation on that you can have emotional relationships with, but that you're also allowed to eat and dissect. And as the next step in his journey will show us, uh, to, to just kill Yeah, this whole question of disambiguating himself from other living things, right? So the plant world and the animal world, um, understanding himself as as human, right, as separate from that, entails this sort of horrifying scenes of sacrifice. Like, first of all, this encounter with the mother's body, but it'll go on from there. Yeah, I know he will start exploring other animals to try to know them better. So there's this emotional imperative to know and understand the body to prevent this kind of loss, but it will lead him to begin collecting other animals and vivisecting them and exploring them while they're still alive so that he can know more about them. I know. Is that true? I'd forgotten that detail. You know, I'd remembered about the dissecting from having read this before. I'd forgotten about the vivisecting, which for anybody who doesn't have that term in hand means dissecting while alive. Yes. Yeah, that's bad. It is bad. and the, and But the text at this <laughs> point doesn't, I mean, yeah, obviously, but the text at this point doesn't treat it as particularly bad. Like the author doesn't seem to be condemning him for it. No, it's utterly cold. We'll, we'll come back to that, I think. But at this point, it's like, yeah, this is a, this is a sensible thing to do. You need to learn about the world. You're going to use what is at your disposal to do that. And he doesn't, he doesn't really think twice about whether he should be doing it this way or not. No, it's all about rational experimentation, right? Trying to get to to greater knowledge. So again, this is an example of these kind of these coldly clinical passages that are kind of hard for I think for modern readers. So he got hold of a beast, tied it down and cut it open as he had the dough and reached the heart. This time he started on the left. Cutting into the heart, he saw the chamber filled with a steamy glass like a white mist. He poked in his finger. It was so hot it nearly burnt him and the animal died instantly. This satisfied him that the hot vapor was what imparted animation to the animal and that every animal has something corresponding. When this departs, the animal dies. Um, And he continues trying to learn more and he follows this up by dissecting and vivisecting many animals, constantly learning and improving the quality of his mind until he had reached the level of the finest natural scientists. So it's, it's very cold and it's serving a certain kind of intellectual end. It's serving him on the path to knowledge, but it's also sacrificial, right? At what cost? The other thing I was really struck by is the ways in which these accounts of dissection are interwoven with this other kind of discovery and mastery of nature. That is his mastery of fire. Did you notice that? Like there's the scene with his mom and then there's where he sort of, you know, acquires fire and he learns to cook things. And then the other dissection scenes take place. Oh, you're right. No, I hadn't, I hadn't quite put two and two together, but yes. Isn't I, that, and very frankenstein again, I think. There's the, there is a distinct scene where a fire breaks out and he he's terrified of it. And then he tries to reach out and try to grasp a piece of it. But when he touched it, it burnt his hand and he couldn't get hold of it. So then he got the idea of taking a brand that was not wholly on fire. And he basically takes a bit of fire back and learns its properties. Mm -hmm. And keeps it up and falls in love with it, right? As we said in the opening passage. I mean, there's also a sort of interesting philosophical point to this as well, because right around the same time, sort of simultaneously, he discovers the distinctions between animal plant, and other mineral, we might usually say now, but other. The hierarchy of being. And also discovers fire, earth, water, and air, the elements. So it's interesting to see how those might be specifically being tied together. Like like these two things, which is the next one that you learn? Well, you sort of can learn both of them at the same time. 
but it's also about establishing material hierarchies, you know, like it's, it's, it's with the death and then the dissection of the mother, the quasi mother, you know, the doe who raises him. Um, it's with that, it's like a huge transition, um, where we start getting this sense of hierarchy in nature, right? So not just the beast, you know, which he then dismembers subsequently and many other animals, right? So he's clearly disambiguating himself from them, right? To some, to some extent, but also like the raw and the cook, like once he has fire, he also, you know, experimentally, he's just like putting things the fire to see how they burn and he does that with a fish and he's like oh this tastes really good right so the raw and the cooked right also becomes part of his sort of hierarchy in the material world and um, the account of the senses and the elements also are participating in that material hierarchy as well one of the interesting things that doesn't really at all come up in the book as a hierarchy is gender oh yeah so there's never a moment when he thinks, oh, these are male and these are female. I mean, there's a couple of almost references, right? So there's when he's looking at the animals and he can't find one like himself, right? Right. So this is not an allusion to gender, but it nonetheless, it kind of opens the door to thinking about that. In other words, there's no, I mean, we think about Adam in the garden, right? I mean, there's no other part, other self, right? So that that's a very sort of sideways kind of allusion to what could perhaps invite us to think about gender. There's also one reference to sexual desire. There's this moment when he's sort of reflecting on how his body requires all these things from him. It demanded sensory things of him, food, drink, intercourse. And, and like, you read that, you're like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> right? Where's that coming from? <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, I guess sexual desire would kind of make sense, but intercourse would mean, you know, another being with which to course, you know what I mean? Right. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so there's like this, so there's this sense in which both with him looking at the animals and looking to find another one like himself and that bodily yearning for intercourse, right? That there's this potentiality. Which, which never becomes totally visible. The um, one other kind of interesting moment where the idea of the feminine shows up, but it's very oblique. It's this moment when uh, High is in his ecstatic experience, you know, engaging with the divine, and he sort of comes back to the to the world of the living. Little by little, he pulled himself together. His senses came back. He regained consciousness from what seemed to have been a faint and lost his foothold on that plane of experience. As the world of the senses loomed back into view, the divine world vanished. For the two cannot be joined in one state of being, like two wives. If you make one happy, you make the other one miserable. Oh, right. Right. And so this is not at all about high encountering, like this is not about a feminine character, but it's a kind of a reminder that we live in a world where there are wives and they're only there as an analogy that, that the spiritual world, and the material world are like two wives and you subject normatively male you know, <laughs> um, cannot satisfy them both. I mean, it's a very loaded metaphor, if you ask me. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's also one that's sort of, as you say, taking place outside of the story, right? This isn't something High's thinking. This is something Ibn Dufal is saying when he's telling us about it. Exactly. But it's reminding us what the normative subject is, right? I mean, like, it's not just about Aristotelian notions of, like, the perfect, you know, that the female is a defective male. I mean, Aristotle says that, right? So it's a sort of, it's a, it's a concept that's deep in writing about physiology and antiquity and through the Middle Ages and, you know, sometimes later, that um, normative nature is male. I mean, that's why to this day, right, when you have, like, you know, medical experimentation and, you know, testing of drugs and so on, like, the default is generally not female right. studies, right? I mean, I don't want to reach too far in making that comparison, but that's a default, right? So there's kind of a medical substrate for that way of thinking. But also, you know, this is a book about spiritual experience, right? And so it's setting up for us a world in which, how can I put it, gender is kind of in, is, is, is rendered invisible because there's just this normative male subject, right? And so it's, it's giving us this very, I don't know, not just narrow, but almost like a, a point for understanding human nature, like the, the ground point for understanding human nature. Um, and it's this man, right? It's this kind of perfectly natural man. And, you know, we'll make of that what you will, right? I mean, it's a book that's really interesting in some ways, but it's at the cost of erasing an awful lot. Sure. But I, but I, I am fascinated by the fact that it doesn't make a point of that. Like, it, like it, it does it quietly, at least. Like, it's assumed male. Yeah. It has a male main character that is the natural man. That is the kind of person who would emerge from the clay. So it's got mm -hmm. that going on. But it doesn't go out of its way to heavy-handedly say, 
you know, there were male creatures and there were female creatures, and one of them is clearly superior, and one of them has this function. Oh, it doesn't even need to say that. I mean, no, it I doesn't. Find that, but it's, but you know. it says a lot of things it doesn't need to say, perhaps. Yeah, but but one of the things interesting too is that you know this view of gender, where you know masculine gender is normative, it's coming in some ways out of this, these Aristotelian commitments to um, natural philosophy, like the material world. But it's also coming, I think, out of Neoplatonic commitments to um, ontology, like to ways of being. So I'm reminded of this really neat passage in a um, also 12th century uh, work, but it's um, a Latin work, um, Bernardo Silvestris' Cosmographia, um, which you probably know, right? Um, and it's, again, it's very suffused by similar kinds of philosophical commitments to, to Neoplatonism. And it makes this point that in the chain of being, like of all creation, all things are masculine to what lies below them, but feminine relative to what lies above them. So that in a really interesting way, gender is always kind of relative yeah. in this sort of Neoplatonic economy, right? Because it's about active and passive, masculine, active, feminine, passive. And so when you have hierarchical relations, gender flows out of it. And so high inhabits, both in material and spiritual terms, this kind of philosophical landscape. Yeah. Hmm. It's so weird. It is very weird. Um, that section leads to a very philosophical section of the book. The, the middle of the book is just digging deeper and deeper into more and more abstract modes of thought. But I'd like to fast forward a bit and get to the point where he has devised the concept of God and is starting to engage in practices to bring him closer to that. Well, actually, before we get to that, I should say that on one step of that, he decides to basically stop eating meat. Oh, yeah. This is such an interesting section. Not only does he decide to stop eating meat, but he also tries very hard not to damage plants. Yeah. Because he wants to be like higher beings, to be like God, and to be like the heavenly bodies, like the sun. Well, he wants to be consistent with the work of the creator, right? He wants to avoid opposition to the work of the creator, right? And the, the answer, apparently, is to give up meat eating completely. But he can't do that because that would make his own body waste away, which would be even more glaring a contradiction of the work of the creator. <laughs> yeah, although, although it is also th this idea of being more like the heavenly bodies, so the sun provides nutrients for the plants and the animals, and therefore you should also do that. This this also leads to uh, the, the, the heavenly bodies go around in circles, and therefore yeah. you should also spin in circles, which is a really, for me, it was a really interesting part of the analysis. Oh, yeah, but the circles are incredibly interesting. Um, before we leave the food, though, it's, it's so interesting because it's I think it's not so much, how can I put it, this affirmative trying to be like I don't know, the sun or other kinds of things. It's to avoid impairing the work of the creator. It's a lot like Manichaeanism. I don't know if you like ever read about like Manichaean. I mean, this is obviously not directly related to that, but this idea that you don't want to block what emanates from the divine. You don't want to impair what emanates from the divine, right? So he decides that he'll try to choose the lesser of evils, right? So he was going to choose what to eat so as to bring about the least opposition to the work of the creator. So he can eat ripe fruit as long as he's careful not to eat or harm the seeds. And if he can't find fruit with nourishing meat, he can eat seeds, but only if he picks out the most abundant and prolific. Right? And if none of those are available, he, then he would have to eat meat or eggs, but he has to take only from the most abundant and never root out a whole species. So it's about avoiding, like, you know what I mean? It's not affirmative. It's kind of by negation, right? He's got to be careful not to be in the way of the work of creation. I think it's such an interesting, I mean, it's, it's first of all, interesting to think about that in terms of ethical eating and environmental commitments that we might think about in our own frame of reference, but also this idea of like trying not to obstruct or block the work of creation, which flows all around. Yes. I was just I was just looking for those passages. It is both of them. And in fact, they're described one after the other. Seeing that what made him different from all other animals made him like the heavenly bodies, High judged that this implied an obligation on his part to take them as his pattern, imitate their action, and do all he could to be like them. Yeah. The heavenly bodies, that is. Yeah. And then also, just after that, the obligation to, to not hinder the divine will. I guess I found the be like the heavenly bodies to be a little bit more striking. Yeah. What's both of those? That's right. I think that's right. And that's why he's clean. That's why he washes. <laughs> yeah. And the circular motion. That is so interesting, that passage. It is a totally fascinating thing to think, you know, what does it mean to take on 
the stars and uh, and the other heavenly model. bodies as your model. Yeah. How do you yeah. how do you live like them? And it comes up with some interesting answers. Yeah, he prescribed himself circular motion of various kinds. Sometimes he would circle the island, skirting along the beach and roving in the inlets. Sometimes he would march around his house or certain large rocks a set number of times, either walking or at a trot. Or at times he would spin around in circles until he got dizzy. It seems kind of absurd, but it's also super interesting because he's reflecting, what's being reflected here is like certain kinds of Islamic practice, like circumambulation of the Kaaba at the Hajj. Oh yeah, that too. Right? And then also dervish practices in Sufi Islam. Yeah, Right? So um, he's through his natural means, his natural enlightenment, he's arriving at the truths of Islam, right? I mean, it never says that in so many words, but that's what's happening there. Indeed. So eventually he does even transcend trying to be like the heavenly beings and tries to just be like God or, or work himself into the ecstatic state. And he finally successfully does it. And there's a lot that's remarkable about that passage. I think my favorite thing about it is that Ibn Tufail steps in and says, okay, this experience he had, I know you want to hear about it, but it transcends language. Yes. And then he describes a bit of it, and there's this fabulous description of some of the things he saw and the, um, what is it, the uh, the, 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 the creature with 70,000 faces. Oh, yeah, that's such an awesome part. So, yeah, so Ibn Tufail tells us that, you know, I, I can't really put it in words, as you just said, but I can give you a hint and a glimpse, and if you avoid construing my words in their ordinary senses, then I can tell you a little bit more of what he saw in his ecstasy. And then there's these this description, this sort of really tantalizing description. Here, too, was an essence free of matter, not one with those he had seen, but none other. Only this being had 70,000 faces, and every face were 70,000 mouths, and every mouth 70,000 tongues, with which it ceaselessly praised, glorified, and sanctified the being of the one who is truth. And then in this really powerful paragraph, it's like, it's like light. It was as though the form of the sun were shining in rippling water from the last mirror in the sequence, reflected down the series from the first, which faced directly into the sun. Suddenly he caught sight of himself as an unembodied subject. If it were permissible to single out individuals from the identity of the 70,000 faces, I would say that he was one of them. Mm -hmm. It's such a wonderful moment, right? Because it's this like apocalyptic, dizzying vision of multiplicity, right? And what does he see in that ecstatic vision of the divine? He catches a glimpse of himself. Um, there are other texts you could compare this to, like um, Dante seeing the form of man in the Paradiso, or other kinds of um, devotional texts that talk about this kind of moment of almost annihilation. Um, it's such a neat moment. It is. It's a really fascinating moment. It's really wonderful to see how Ibn Tufal tries to thread that needle of giving you something that approaches the ecstatic experience, but obviously can't yes. fulfill that. And I think I think by acknowledging it so heavily, it really helps him do it, right? Yeah, yeah. And after this description, after this whole passage, there's a there's a great moment where he says, you may object, and then a, a bunch of things that the reader might object to the passage that we just talked about. You know, by your own analogy of the reflecting mirrors, the image has permanence only so long as there is a mirror. If the mirror is ruined, then the image is obliterated. <laughs> and he says, I can only reply, it certainly did not take you long to forget our bargain and break uh -huh. my conditions. <laughs> did I not just tell you how narrow my scope for expression is here and warn you that my words would make a false impression in any case? It's like, oh, that's so good. It's so great. He's like, stupid reader, we had a bargain, right? Um, and that's one of these great moments where, you know, the fabric of the of the story gets kind of broken and the um, author is talking to us in this very direct way. There are a few of these and they're so great. Ah, oh, they're totally good. But then after he's had this ecstatic moment, uh, we then finally, finally return to the world of, of plot, so to speak, where and other characters show up all of a sudden. But that's the thing, like we were saying earlier, I get the sense there's almost like two endings here, right? There's this one sort of ecstatic ending here, and then we kind of come back into the regular world. It's a little bit like High himself. He has these visionary ecstatic experiences, and then he's like, oh yeah, I'm back in the world now. Yeah, that would have been a perfectly satisfying place to end the tale. But I do oh, think yeah. that this additional ending is really interesting and compelling. Well, you know what it is, it's almost like a second end, but it's also like a second half, because what we've learned about so far is individual enlightenment, like the one singular individual, right? Um, and now it's like, okay, well, what does that look like in the world if there's more than one person? Yeah, what does that look like in society? What are the political implications? Right? That's what the whole back end of the story is preoccupied with. That and also the interesting, fun relationship between Absal oh. 
the the wise man from the other island who has has gone off to High's island in order to avoid the world and start also going into his ecstatic state and try to be closer to God. Absel and Hai have a really interesting, not terribly well developed, but a really interesting relationship and, and a very nice sort of meeting each other and trying to figure out what's going on because one of them has never seen another human and the other one thought this was an empty island. So, And also the barrier of language is going to be an issue, right? Yeah. Although it seems like it's one that is relatively quickly resolved, but mm-hmm. uh, but yes, there there is a nice sequence like in Frankenstein where Hai learns language and, and they de- describe some of the process of that, which is, I always like that kind of thing. <laughs> but I, but I love the ending that they, that they, these two buddies then go back to Absal's Island and try <laughs> for a bit and it doesn't work. And they're like, oh, well, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. That's not how I naively would have expected that to play out. I would have expected them to be sort of successful. Yeah. Well, they're offering, how can I put it? Even though it's unsuccessful on one level, right, in the sense that others don't follow High and Upsal in their, you know, um, devout journey toward God, right? It's successful in the sense that it's kind of shown us something about enlightenment and the path to enlightenment and who can access it, who cannot. Like, in other words, it's been a kind of a, I don't know, a litmus test for society, right, to tell us who who can find their way in and who can't. And in some ways, that's almost foreshadowed at the very earliest introduction of Absal, when we first hear about him not alone, but um, along with a companion. It says, there had grown up on this island two fine young men of ability and high principle, one named Absal and the other Salomon. Both had taken instruction in religion, right? They're very similar, blah, blah, blah. But Absal was the more deeply concerned with getting down to the heart of things, the more eager to discover spiritual values, and the more ready to attempt a more or less allegorical interpretation. Salomon, on the other hand, was more interested in the literal. Yes. So, so we've already got a sense that there's two kinds of people, right? And Absal is the kind that's kind of looking up. And then these other people are going to have their gaze metaphorically downward, right? They're interested in this world. And that's why for them, regular rules, the prescriptions of religion, you know, in a basic kind of way, that's that's what's appropriate for them. And so it's successful in that sense that it's kind of shown us what does it look like in the world. Yeah, all these aspects of the religion that Absal has that High finds out about. And he's like, why would you even have that? Why do you need so many laws about money? Just money's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. like, well, yeah. oh, yeah, I, I don't disagree. <laughs> and then they go there and they're like, oh, no, these people can't can't get their heads out of money. Yeah. And even though Solomon is considered a fairly wise man, he's just taken this other path. And he's become king of that island. So that's... Like he he's been successful in that sense, and he seems to be reasonably good as a ruler, I guess. But but he can't achieve this higher level, and those who want to achieve that higher level need to, it seems, reject society. Well, yeah, that's exactly it. There's no way for society as a whole to take this path. This path is by definition available only to the few, right? So when High and Upsal kind of realize this, there's this real sense of resignation, right? Um, Hai and his friend Absal now knew that even this aspiring group, right, these are a small group of people who are, are trying to, to make the path of enlightenment, but they can't. Even they fell short and could be saved only in their own way. If ever they were to venture beyond their present level to the vantage point of insight, what they had would be shattered. And even so, they would be unable to reach the level of the blessed. They would waver and slip, and their end would be all the worse. But if they went along as they were until overtaken by death, they would win salvation. Right? So... They're more limited, right? That's 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 the best they can do. But High and Upsal, they're they go back to the island um, where High had um, grown to maturity and uh, searched for ecstasy as they had before. Thus, they served God on the island until man's certain fate overtook them. It feels like such a potentially unsatisfying ending for us now, where I guess we we often like our plots to end where. If there's a better way that it should be accessible to everyone. I know, but it's like it's inviting you. I mean, this is devotional writing, right? I mean, that's what I meant by the theological mess, right? It's inviting you to do something. Like, it's, how can I put it? Inviting you to write the later chapters, right? That's why he says this at the end. I have not left the secret set down in these few pages entirely without a veil, a sheer one, easily pierced by those fit to do so, but capable of growing so thick to those unworthy of passing beyond that they will never breach it, right? So the question is, you, reader, you know, are you someone who's fit to do so, to pierce the veil, or are you somebody incapable of passing beyond, right? Um, so it's kind of setting up this, I don't know, half-open door yeah. for you, um, which, as you're saying, like, for us modern readers, like, that that sits kind of weirdly. That acknowledgement 
that there might be people who just can't, who can't open that door. Yeah, they just can't. Is, is just not one that we encounter as often. I, it feels to me. I, I don't know. I yeah. feel like that's one of the things that, that I quite like about the ending is that it really just upends my sense of how endings are supposed to work and how, how access to the highest level is supposed to be distributed. No, I think that's right. I mean, as you know, as we're talking about this aspect of, uh, of the work, I'm thinking about how it's in some ways kind of novelish, but in some ways it's not at all like a novel because novels, I mean, if I can generalize, they're promiscuous, right? They're always opening themselves up to you, right? I mean, it's not that they're not sometimes difficult to read or challenging you one way or the other, but they're rarely kind of closing the door most of the way. Hmm. Don't you think? I mean, I'm thinking about Middlemarch. I'm thinking about Henry James. I'm thinking about novels that are hard going. But they never, it's not that the door is closed, right? It's more like, you know, that you kind of have to work for it. It's not, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. But uh, it's an interesting thing to think about, like where where this work sits as literature relative to other things we've read or that we might read. Yeah, I'd have to think about that thing you were proposing. But absolutely, this idea of, is this literature? How is this literature? Is this n- like a novel? I mean, that's a weird genre to pin this under because the novel like novels are a thing that historically happened, <laughs> but yeah, no, right. But but can we read this the way that we're now trained to read novels? Is it is it does it work that way? Obviously, it doesn't play by the normal rules of Middlemarch. I feel like it totally doesn't fit like as novel, but I do feel like I would not be at all freaked out if somebody put this in a syllabus for a science fiction class. Yeah, or, you know, I mean, because it totally hangs in with that. I mean, if you if you would put in something like Frankenstein, or you'd put in like you know twentieth and twenty first century science fiction that's about exploring you know creation and how things come into being. Yeah, the book is pure world building in in a yeah. sense. It just happens yeah. to be arguing that this is it's built our world more or less. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think yeah. it, I think it totally would fit in there. I think it also might fit in with certain other types of experimental novels that are less interested in character interaction and more interested in creating a a world or thinking through some philosophical ideas. I'm thinking mm-hmm. about things like David Markson's Wittgenstein's Mistress, which is about a woman wandering around the earth after everyone else has died and thinking about what she can remember of culture. It's a very interesting novel. Or um, there's a novel by Christine Brooke Rose called Subscript, which is a really interesting, difficult work, but it's about evolution over like each chapter is the next chapter in the story of our evolution. And it's just like, they're taking this idea of the form and just radically changing what the rules of it are in order to explore certain ideas. And in my mind, this echoes a lot of that kind of writing. You know, they're playing out in different ways, of course, but the sense of, of, of what do we go to literature for? It's not always for the ethical explorations that something like Middlemarch offers us, even though that is sort of what we think the novel is maybe best at. Well, that that's the really interesting question, isn't it? I mean, what is literature for? Or what is the story for? What is it doing? You know, what is it doing to you? What is it like? And when I say what is it for, like, how is it instrumental? Because it's clearly meant to be instrumental here. It's meant to be a way for you to get from here to there. Like it's a vehicle almost. Um, and I find that really fascinating. It's neat too how you were saying um, that Hayam Yaktan kind of echoes um, some of these kinds of um, contemporary workings of the novel, right? Because the temporality of that is so weird, right? Like this is a work that's written hundreds of years before the novel emerges as a genre, right? I mean, where where does it inhabit that landscape in terms of genre? Like it's a it's in between. It's you know neither here nor there. It's a story that is meant to be read figuratively or allegorically to get you somewhere else. In that sense, we could compare it to things like I don't know, parables or um, myth that's meant to have a kind of secondary level of interpretation. So it sits in a very strange spot. So we'll be looking at another science fiction-y philosophical novel next time, Margaret Cavendish's The Blazing World, Mm. which I don't know anything about. I've only read part of it before. I'm really looking forward to reading it for next time. I know that people really love it. So, so I'm super looking forward to reading that. I should also say, if you're looking for more information about Hayab and Yakthan, I learned about it first from another podcast called The History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps, which did a terrific little episode about it that is more interested in some of the philosophical traditions. So we'll have a link to that in the show notes. You should certainly check it out. He'll, he'll make, he makes a point about that. You shouldn't skip the, the, the preface where he's contextualizing all the philosophy he's going to be doing in the book. Yeah, no, that is fascinating. So if you're coming in from a philosophical angle, then yeah, you shouldn't skip that. But, but if you're, if you're with us, if you're just reading it as <laughs> literature, you can totally skip ahead. <laughs> 
But until then, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you. Show notes with links for all the things we've mentioned in this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 17. And The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time. See you again at The Spouter Inn.